All right, this will be class number nine of our CSE 103. And hopefully we're going to finish what's on seminar part five tonight. We will try anyway of my regular seminar series. Um, Satan has had plans since he was a puppy, apparently, to rule the world. I don't know what his problem is, but he thinks he ought to run the world. Uh, he doesn't think God can do a good job, so he's got a burr under his saddle for some reason. And he's used all sorts of people down through history to try to gain control of the world. And we've studied some of his thoughts and plans over the last 6,000 years. He has plans now, rapidly coming to a head, for a new world order, a one world government. Many people are involved in this. A lot of people probably don't even know they're involved in it. And so we're kind of in the middle of that section on the New World Order. A lot of rich, uh, powerful people in this world are on Satan's side and maybe don't even know it. Some, I think, do, you know. Some really honestly think Lucifer is going to win. They think Satan's going to take over God's kingdom and rule. Well, they are in for a surprise. But what's happening now in America... Uh, America seems to be one of the key players in the race toward a new world order. Now, there's some awful good godly people in our government, always have been. But there are some wicked, vile people in our government also, and always have been. And there's, a, there's spiritual warfare in high places, including in, in the U.S. government. So, they have plans to rule the world. Our founding father set up a system with checks and balances, where you have the executive branch, legislative, legislative branch, and the judicial branch, and they all balance each other, so one can't really take control. And just in case the whole system gets out of whack and the government goes bad, we have a Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Now the people can prevent the government from getting out of control. And that is a big obstacle toward the New World Order is the Second Amendment. Well, we covered that earlier. So they've got plans toward a New World Order. What's happening now, though, ever since Abraham Lincoln is issued the first executive order, they found a way to bypass the entire constitutional process the president can, sim can simply say, oh, there's a state of emergency, we're at war, therefore, I declare blah, 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 and it becomes, you know, um, it has the same effect as law. Lincoln issued a first executive order ordering tr Yan Yankee troops to invade the South. Okay, unconstitutional, it was Lincoln's war, there's a long story behind that. Lincoln himself was a, probably a good guy, well-meaning, Probably didn't realize what he was doing was, uh, maybe he did, I don't know. But you know, he, what he did was wrong, okay? Uh, states' rights was the issue for the war, not slavery. Anyway, executive orders come and go, and they can actually be rescinded. Some of these executive orders we're going to read right now were given and then were later rescinded by a later executive order. One president could right now issue an executive order and say, I hereby rescind all previous executive orders. That's all he'd have to do. But the fact, the, fact that makes, the thing that makes me nervous is that the fact that they can do this at all. They can really govern by executive order. Just simply write an order and it becomes law unless Congress uh, or the Senate nullifies it within 90 days, I, I believe is the way it works. There's a couple of good websites if you want to get more information on executive orders, and they keep you posted which ones are in effect and which ones are rescinded. Uh, Whitehouse.gov slash virtual library has executive orders, or N ara.gov slash fedreg, fed for Federal Register, slash EO underline JFK has a list of executive orders and uh, what they deal with. Some of the current ones that people were very concerned about when Y2K was going to be a problem was, they said in case of an emergency, the federal government, Executive Order 10995, federal government will seize all communications media in the United States. Notice it's capital U, capital S. That is the corporate United States, which we covered earlier. Uh, executive order number 10997 was federal seizure of all electric power, all fuels, all minerals, public and private. They would have the right to come get your gas can out of your garage because they need it for, you know, need it for the government. Executive order 10998, federal seizure of all food supplies, resources, public and private, and all farms and equipment. This is the type of thing they can do. They just issue this order. The order sits there in the event there's an emergency and they need to activate it, and they'll call out the Marines or whoever to enforce these things, okay? And there's all sorts of executive orders, and some people have called me or written me saying, hey, don't you know that one was rescinded? Okay, yes, I'm sure some come and go, and are res they're rescinded by later uh, executive orders. The fact is that they can do it. That ought to bother everybody, okay? Executive Order 10999 was federal seizure of all means of transportation. 
This is one of the reasons we talked earlier about people don't really own their car. You get a certificate of title, and you actually have to rent your car every year from the government. Uh, the fact, if you have a license plate on your car, it really doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the government, and the title is held in Tal the, the, uh, owners, the certificate of origin is actually held in Tallahassee. The government really owns that car. And you've got to pay a fee every year to keep that license plate updated. Okay? And by the way, there are ways around that. I've not done that. Okay? There are many people who do, though. They just put a little paper on there that says, driving by right. <laughs> just drive, you know. And there's a lot of people do that. And, and it's perfectly, perfectly legal. I, I don't have time to slay every dragon and fight every war. So I haven't taken that one on yet. Um, Executive Order 11,000, federal seizure of all American people for workforces. This is what Hitler did. This is what dictators do all through history, you know. Hey, come with me, you're now in the army. This is what Saddam Hussein did. Or Hussein. He just got all his people and said, look, you get out there and go stand there and you're going to hold off the enemy. And when they were so anxious to surrender after several days of bombing, you know, <laughs> those, a lot of old guys out there, they just wanted to go home, okay? I don't want to be out here fighting. <laughs> I just want to go home. Please, I surrender, you know. Uh, but the federal government, under executive order uh, 11,000, has the authority to seize everybody and say, come with me, you're going over here, you're now in the federal workforce. Your job is to be a rice farmer, to raise rice for the elite. Uh, Fed Executive Order 11001, seize all health, education, and welfare facilities, public and private. 11002, Postmaster General can register all men, women, and children in the United States of America. 11003, federal seizure of all airports, all aircraft, public and private. 1004, forced relocation. So everybody out, you're moving. This area has now become, you know, top secret zone for something. Doesn't matter. The, they have the authority to do that. Take over your house. Seize all railways, all inland waterways, all storage facilities, public and private. Provide FEMA complete authorization. FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Authority. This is the group to watch, in my humble opinion. Okay? These are the ones that are going to be the enforcers of the New World Order. There's their symbol. Federal Emergency Management Agency. I'm not authority. Agency. There's a 60-minute uh, audio tape report from Iron Mountain by Tex Mars that really is good dealing with FEMA. One guy told me, he was, I was at a meeting, and he said uh, there had been a, I think it was after the hurricane down in uh, uh, South Florida. He said he was out there in his yard, uh, what was left of his yard, you know, in the house and everything, and FEMA, some FEMA guys were there on the scene because it was an emergency. Okay, the hurricane blew the town away. And this guy's on his bulldozer, and he's, uh, you know, clearing some stuff. And knock, he accidentally knocks some tree limbs into this guy's swimming pool. So this guy's yelling at the bulldozer driver, Hey, watch where you're going. You're knocking limbs into my pool. The FEMA guy came over and said, Sir, you shut your mouth. So this guy said, Look, I don't know who you are, fella, but this is my property. The FEMA fella said, Sir, I don't think, oh, no, I, don't, uh, I don't know who you are, but... I'm from FEMA, and if I tell that bulldozer driver to drive his bulldozer through your house, he will do it, and there's not a thing you can do about it. And that is true, and that is the attitude that ought to scare everybody. <laughs> we have gotten ourselves in trouble. Okay? We've signed, away a con we've signed contracts to sign away all of our rights. Who's doing this? Why? Ultimately, if you step back and look at the big picture... Satan has plans, and a lot of little people are involved in his plans. Many of them probably don't even realize what they're doing. God is even above all that, laughing at, at Satan's plans, okay? He's going to win in the end. So we as Christians don't need to get nervous. I think we need to get busy, but we don't need to get nervous. And I interview people and talk to people all the time who are students of the New World Order, you know, and they read all the books, and I've read dozens and dozens of books about the New World Order, okay? But they come away with a totally wrong attitude. They live their life paranoid and scared stiff, you know. Um, look, we win. Relax. God's in charge. Just do what the Master said. Okay? He's the boss. Do what he says. I'll give you some ideas. A lot of people involved in the New World Order. For instance, the United Nations, a key player. The property for the United Nations was donated by Rockefeller. He donated the land to build that huge building on American soil. The best thing we can do for American sovereignty would be to get a huge bulldozer like a Cat D11 and push the whole United Nations building into the harbor. Okay? Let everybody get out first, right? 
but has no business being on American soil, and America has no business being involved in the United Nations. That is just absolutely one of the dumbest things we ever did, get involved in the United Nations. The World Council of Churches. Now, there is a group called, I think it's called the National Council of Churches, which is actually a pretty good group. Uh, it's either the National Council or the American Council. I don't, I don't remember which one's which now, but one's good, one's bad. Okay, but the World Council of Churches certainly is uh, a bad bunch, and they've gotten all the churches together, and they really want to develop a one-world religion. CFR is the Council of Foreign Relations. These are, this is a top-secret group started to, you know, control world uh, uh, events, okay? The Trilateral Commission is, I believe, uh, America, England, and Japan, trilateral for three. They also are another one of these small players in the big picture toward one world government. The Bilderbergers is a, um, goes back to the European uh, bankers and financiers who control huge amounts of money and really basically control world events. I mean, they have so much money, they, they will get the government in debt to them, and therefore, they tell the government what to do. After all, you're in debt. You do this, we would like you to go invade this country because they're not cooperating, you know, with our plans. And it, uh, heaven is going to reveal, Judgment Day will reveal some things that we're all going to say, wow, is that what happened? <laughs> we're going to be shocked at the wicked things people have done for the love of money. The IMF is the International Monetary Fund. They are certainly a key player in this by controlling the finances. Remember, love of money is what? Root of all evil. Keep that thought in mind. The international bankers, the Club of Rome, the communists, of course, the socialists. By the way, communism would have collapsed. It would, it would be just a footnote in history had it not been for the American and European rich guys financing the communist takeover. They wanted the communist takeover because they wanted to have a threat as an excuse for us to build up a big military force. You have to have a, a reason, you know, why do we need all these missiles? Those things are expensive. Well, we've got to watch out for the Russians, you know. And so the people fork over their money to pay for all this military buildup. But if, they, if there wasn't an enemy, or at least a perceived enemy, there would be no reason people would not have gone along with the horrendous debt we've gotten ourselves into. Uh, Dennis Cuddy has a great book on the NEA, which is the National Education Association. If you want to get involved and see how that National Education Association has been taken over by uh, communist-minded people who have plans for a one-world government, and they are working diligently to use the education system in America as a tool to change kids, to prepare them to be good slaves in the New World Order. Uh, you can get into the N N National Education Assist uh, Association. And I encourage every public school teacher to get out of the NEA. In our seminar notebook, uh, one of the last pages, you should have one of those, is the uh, battle plan, what to do. In that section is a list of some other organizations where teachers can join that are not part of the NEA. They can still have their insurance and benefits and things that the association offers without getting involved in the... Um, uh, uh, evil, NEA, for lack of a better term. Now, it's the National Organization for Wild Women. Uh, they are very much involved in uh, wanting a one-world government. The ACLU, of course, the American Communist Lawyers Union. The Masonic Lodge. Now, here's where I'll get 100 phone calls, I'm sure. I'm prepared for them, believe me, okay? Here is the, uh, what uh, the General Albert Pike, who was, at, during his time, in, 100 years ago, was the world leader of the Masonic Lodge. He said, that which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a God, but it is a God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the highest degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Yes, Lucifer is God. Very few Masons understand what they're in until they get to the very top, and then all of a sudden they realize, wow, this is a satanic organization. Ask a Mason if he's allowed to pray in the Masonic Lodge in the name of Jesus. Watch what happens. I gave this book right here, Masonry Beyond the Light, to one of the guys at our church at Marcus Point Baptist who was a Mason. Been in it for years. He said, Brother Hovind, somebody told me you don't like the Masons. I said, oh, I've got many good friends that are Masons. 
uh, they do a lot of good. It's a do-gooders club. But when you get to the top, you realize it's satanic. He said, oh, it is not. I've been in it for years. I said, okay, I don't want to argue with you. Read this book. When you're done, give me a call. We'll talk, okay? He came back two weeks later, handed me the book. He said, I want you to know I quit the Masonic Lodge, and I've encouraged about six of my friends to quit the Masonic Lodge. He said, it's a satanic organization, isn't it? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> it certainly is. But see, they will, they will run you down a particular track if they think, you know, you're a religious person, like Billy Graham is a Mason, or was made an honorary Mason, I guess. Um, they will try to get religious people in there and make them a Mason, and they come to the meetings, and they think, wow, this is a do-gooders club, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they never do find out what they're in. They spend a lifetime thinking, you know, everything's fine. Um, Chriswell at the First Baptist Church in Dallas, you know, Pastor Chriswell, a Mason. I, the list of Masons will surprise you. There are some really, really, really good people in there who just are flat duped, in my opinion. They don't have a clue what they're in. Manley Hall, in his book called The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, said, When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly handle energy. Hmm. Scarlet and the Beast. I met with the author of this book. Uh, he's a friend of mine in Texas. He has written several books on uh, the Masonic Lodge and how it ties in. If you really want to get the go down deep, stay down long, all the documented stuff on the Masonic Lodge. He works under a pseudonym, uh, calls himself John Henry, that is not his real name, because he knows they'll kill him if they can find him. That's the way they work, by the way. Um, we can go all day on this. I would, if you want more on Masons, I would suggest you read one of these uh, books. This one's available from Chick Publication, Masonry Beyond the Light, uh, really good book. John Ankerberg has a great videotape and uh, book on the Masonic Lodge. Uh, I've been on John Ankerberg program. He and I would differ on several things, but uh, he's a great guy. You know, friend, I would consider him a friend of mine. He's got a good book if you want more on the Masonic Lodge. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, swear not at all. Pretty clear, right? Here's the oath the Masons have to swear. This is one of the first oaths. They have all sorts of them at every level. The Mason, um, to get in the lodge, will say, I, he puts his name in here, do hereby swear that I will always conceal and never reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry to any person. If I do, I consent to having my throat cut from ear to ear, my tongue torn out by the roots, my body buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark. Can you imagine Jesus saying something like that? I, no Christian should be in the Masonic Lodge, period. Okay? If you are, you ought to get right with God and get out. Okay? I know you think you're in a do-gooders club. I've got some very close friends, some relatives that are in the Masonic Lodge that have been in it for years and don't see a thing wrong with it. They will, Judgment Day. They'll realize their time and their money and their energy has gone to support a satanic cause and they should have been putting it into God's cause. James chapter 5, the Bible says, Above all things, my brethren, swear not. Now, satanic groups will take certain holidays just like Christians have holidays. Okay? 33rd degree Mason is an honorary title. In the Masonic Lodge, 33 degrees is very uh, uh, important. 33rd day of the year happens to be February 2nd, which is called what? Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day, right. Remember the movie Groundhog Day? The guy got to do the same day over and over until he got it just right, you know? Um, February 2nd is the first satanic holiday of the year, is my understanding. Just like we would celebrate Christmas or Easter or something, they will celebrate February 2nd as the first satanic holiday because it is the 33rd day of the year. Uh, 1933, Roosevelt passed the War Powers Act he ordered all private gold turned in to the government. Remember he showed you the uh, Federal Reserve notes, 1928. It says you can redeem this for gold. 1934, it doesn't say that anymore. Matter of fact, if you own gold, you were considered an enemy of the state and could go to prison. It was treason to own gold. 1933, Rockefeller sent money to set up Adolf Hitler in Germany. Two 33rd degree Masons, Laurel and Hardy, how many have heard of them? Made a movie called Sons of the Desert with all sorts of secret Masonic stuff in it. You have to watch the movie very carefully. The Masons will see these things. 
For instance, uh, as Joseph Smith, the founder of the uh, Moron Church, was, uh, was dying, he was being shot, okay? He gave the Mas Masonic distress symbol, which is like this. If you put your arm, it's supposed to be part of a square, okay? Any Mason who sees that is obligated under their Masonic oath to come to your aid and help you. If a man is a Mason in court and he knows the judge is a Mason, there are different symbols, things that they do, handshakes, uh, grips, you know, the way they stand. They'll put their hand like this, the lawyer will. That's a sign, judge, you better help me here. I'm having trouble with this case and I've got to win this case. And you're a Mason and I'm a Mason. Now come on, help me out here, fella. <laughs> they just, they've got loads of these things, these secret things going on that the average person is never going to catch. 1933, uh, Vice President Henry Wallace, who was an occultist, worshipped you know, into the occult, decided to put the Great Seal on the $1 bill. Here's a picture of the Great Seal, the all-seeing eye. Now, I take a lot of flack for this. People have argued for centuries, or for, for decades, what this symbol represents. Let me tell you one of the theories, all right? The eye on top represents Lucifer, the all-seeing eye. There's a gap between the eye and the pyramid, symbolizing their job of accomplishing a new world order is not quite done yet. Lucifer has not yet been installed as the chief cornerstone. Now, see, Jesus Christ is actually going to be the chief cornerstone, but Lucifer wants to, you know, he wants that job. There are 13 rows of stones. Very interesting. There were 13 degrees in the blue lodges of the Masonic Lodge. Behind the uh, pyramid on the dollar bill, you will notice there's nothing, desert. In front of the pyramid, you've got things growing, some bushes and grass and things like that. This symbolizes that they think they will bring the world out of this desert, you know, terrible times into a wonderful, you know, lush Garden of Eden type of thing. On the bottom is a date in Roman numerals. Anybody know that date on there? Bottom of the one dollar of the pyramid? 1776 in Roman numerals. 1776 is, of course, a famous date in America, but it's also the date the Illuminati was started. A guy named Adam Weishaupt started a group called the Illuminati, the Enlightened Ones. That'd be a good quiz question there, Becky. Adam Weishaupt started a group called the Illuminati. They had secret meetings to decide how to control the world. Their group was exposed, and they went underground. It has resurfaced numerous times, and this, of course, the, the individual players die off, but the, the, the cause continues. And they still have their plans for the one world government, new world order. 1933, the first Humanist Manifesto was signed. One of the signers of this was a guy named John Dewey. John Dewey is the father of our educational system here in America. John Dewey uh, was in Vermont at a teacher's college. He was a humanist. He wanted, uh, he claimed to be an atheist, and he said, I'm going to take over the teacher's college, worked his way to, he became the top, and then he influenced all the people coming through that teacher's college, which later went out and became presidents of other teacher's colleges. And John Dewey had just an incredible impact on our educational system, leading it toward socialism, communism, New World Order type stuff, which is where we are now. Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, said, The most wonderful thing of all is that the distinguished Lutheran and Calvinist theologians who belong to our order really believe that they see in it, that's the Illuminati, the true and genuine sense of Christian religion. O oh, mortal man, is there anything you cannot be made to believe? It was all a hoax, and many Christians, people claiming to be Christians, fell right in line and started getting into this. There are Christians today in some of these groups that really think that's going to be good for the world. They're going to find out they're working for Satan after it's too late. If you want more books on the uh, New World Order type stuff, there's all sorts of good books you can read. The Federal Reserve certainly tied in. We covered that earlier. Uh, Dave Hunt has a great book, a, Woman's Ride, a Woman Rides the Bee, showing the Catholic Church and their involvement. Average Catholic doesn't have a clue about what really goes on behind the scenes when you get up to the top of the Catholic Church. Then they find out, wow, we, this is really wicked. And there's an awful lot of good people that are Catholics. They don't find out the truth until it's too late. Um, the uh, book Masonry Beyond the Light, Tex Morris has written extensively on this, uh, this topic, okay, and has lots of good material. New Age Bible Versions by Gail Ripplinger is just a <coughs> tremendous book showing how Satan has spent so much time and energy developing new versions of the Bible, which are 
perverted, for lack of a better term. I've been reading the last couple of nights uh, a book by Sam Gipp. Uh, Sam Gipp is a friend of mine who has written extensively on the King James Version. He and I went to lunch together a few weeks ago when he came to visit. His son is a student at, here at PCC, I think, or, or no, at uh, PBI, I believe. Doesn't matter. He's a student here in town somewhere. But uh, you really better be cautious which version of the Bible you use because there have been some very serious changes. And Sam Gipp's book is one of the best I've read showing some, some of the um, problems with the new versions. Gary Ka writes extensively on the New World Order and Route to Global Occupation. is a great book showing how we're headed right down the road that Satan wants to have a one world government. Um, Revelation chapter 2. Talking to the seven churches, the angel said, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. The symbol for years of Satan worshipers has been the goat's head. Uh, that's where the expression kids comes from. A kid is a baby goat. It's an insult to say, to call someone a kid, because that means you're a child of the devil. Average person doesn't know that anymore, and I, I've, I have done it for so long, it would be probably impossible for me to break the habit, you know, say we had 30 kids over today. But it really is, a kid is a, a child of a goat, right? And so that was the expression. You know, and I have people in seminars sometimes, a lot of homeschoolers will say to me, Brother Holman, I don't have any kids, I have children. <laughs> kids are, are of the devil. <laughs> I don't know, it's not a big deal to me, but the Bible says in Matthew chapter 25, he shall... The shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. Set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Many of these New World Order type clubs have the upside down five pointed star as their symbol. Very interesting. That's the symbol, the satanic symbol, uh, representing the goat's head. The two horns, the ears, and the uh, mouth coming down. The five pointed star upside down. Satan worshippers all across America use this symbol freely in lots of their things, have the upside-down five-pointed star. Very interesting to note that Washington, D.C. was laid out this way. Here's one of the original maps of Washington, D.C. Notice the upside-down five-pointed star. You ever wonder why the streets go so crazy in Washington, D.C.? Why not just right angles like every other town, you know? Why does Pennsylvania Avenue go at such a weird angle? Well, it just so happens that the very bottom of the upside-down five-pointed star is the White House. And some have argued, oh, this is just a coincidence. Others have argued, oh, no, this is, I don't, I don't know the answer. If you find out, please let me know. But it wouldn't surprise me if there weren't some, you know, evil men involved in this, you know, laying their plans for a one-world government. So see what you can find out about that. Let me know. Okay, I get asked the question all the time. Will Christians be here? for the time of tribulation. The Bible teaches there's a time of tribulation coming. It's going to get bad. Are we going to be here? Christians fall into several different camps on this issue. What I'm going to do is tell you the different theories and tell you my opinion. Uh, I don't think the Bible is clear enough to be dogmatic. But every different group thinks they're right, of course, and every other group is wrong. This is standard procedure in Christianity. Some people think the next thing that happens is the rapture. Christians are taken out, Satan rules the world for seven years, then the Lord comes back with the Christians and sets up his kingdom and reigns for a thousand years. That is called pre-tribulation rapture. Okay? I have been in that camp for 30-some years. Um, I'm still uh, open for discussion on the topic, but I think we've missed a key point uh, in this argument, and we'll get to that in a minute. Other people think, no, in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, which is prophesied in Daniel and in Revelation, the seven-year time when Satan rules the world, in the middle is when the Christians are caught out. Those people are called mid-trib rapture. So basically, there's a seven-year tribulation time. There's beginning, a middle, and an end. And some people say the Christians are caught out in the middle. I heard one fellow give a very interesting sermon and uh, interesting case for a split rapture. And I don't know if I believe it or not, but here's what he said. He said the Jews had... Uh, a deal with every year they would go through the crop and pick out the first fruits, the things that got ripe early. And they would gather everything that ripened early and offer it as a sacrifice to the Lord, the offering of the first fruits. Then they would go back a few weeks later and harvest the rest of the crop. I said, yeah, so what? 
He said, well, I think God's going to come at the beginning of the tribulation, catch out all of the Christians that are active trying to serve him, those that are already ripe, so to speak, take them on to heaven. The rest of the weak, mealy mouth Christians are going to have to stay here for a while. And then they get taken out later. Uh, interesting. Okay. I, I wouldn't... I don't know. <laughs> it just was an interesting new thought. I never thought of that before. Others say, no, there's not even going to be a tribulation. You know, we're going to bring in the kingdom. You know, we're going to get so many Christians, we're going to change the world, and we're going to... Those are the Reconstructionists, you know. A lot of Presbyterians fall into that category. They think we're going to just, you know, get so many... We're going to change the world and make everybody great. And Jesus is going to come down and say, thank you for setting up my kingdom. I'm ready to take over now. Okay, I... I I doubt that, <laughs> but uh, there are some who believe that. There's the thing I, point I think we've missed in all of this. There's a difference between tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is what the world does to us. Wrath is what God does to the world. Let me show you the verses on this. Wrath is what God does to the world. I think we're promised pretty clearly we shall be saved from wrath, Romans chapter 5. So there is a school of thought, which I, I've investigated as thoroughly as I know how. It's still open for discussion, but some people think Christians are going to be here for part of the tribulation, but we're raptured out before the wrath. That's called pre-wrath rapture, as opposed to pre-tribulation rapture. Because if it's pre-tribulation rapture, it's already several thousand years too late for an awful lot of Christians. They've already gone through horrible tribulations. <laughs> but they had, nobody has gone through the wrath of God yet. Uh, the wrath of God is for the children of disobedience, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. It tells us, 2 Timothy, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Things are going to get bad. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So those are the, uh, the basic uh, ideas that, you know, Jesus comes before the tribulation, Jesus comes before the wrath of God, Jesus comes in the middle of the tribulation, or he comes after the tribulation, and those that happen to survive uh, are rescued, if, if anybody, okay? The Bible says Satan's going to deceive the whole world, Revelation chapter 12. Okay, let's take a little break. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, what we should do about it. Practical steps. What do we do? Coming up next. All right, let's uh, <clears throat> take up where we left off. Hosea said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I think one thing we need to do as God's children is try to stay informed, you know, what's going on. Okay, be alert. Alerts live longer, you know. So I th one of our jobs is to uh, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that's in us. Satan has plans. Doesn't matter what, he, what his plans are because God is going to win. And we've covered earlier how he wants to reduce the population of the world. Covered that in seminar part one about his goals to, you know, reduce the population, get rid of people. I think what we need today are people of understanding. People who know what's happening and can tell us what to do. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28, but a man, by, by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. If we had some people who had some understanding and some knowledge, we could prolong the state of well-being and health and happiness, you know, in, in our country. Deuteronomy chapter 1. They said, take you wise men and understanding. <clears throat> in uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon said, Lord, I want you to give your servant an understanding heart. If you pray for anything, I would suggest you pray for God to give you wisdom and understanding. Abigail... First Samuel, the Bible tells us Abigail was a woman of good understanding. And beautiful countenance, that doesn't hurt, you know. But she was a woman of good understanding. Eliezer, uh, he said, Then I sent, sent I for Eliezer, for Ariel, for the other guys who is nobody's name, who nobody can pronounce her name, chief of men and somebody else, and I can't pronounce his name, men of understanding. All through Ezekiel, I mean, I'm sorry, through Ezra, you see them talk about men of understanding. Five times, just in one chapter. They said, Lord, please give us men of understanding, or God gave us men of understanding to know what to do. First Chronicles. The children of Issachar were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Well, we need somebody to tell us what to do because world events are, are baffling, you know. What do we do? 
Number one, I think it's time to get motivated. <laughs> I like this picture with the T-Rex chasing that little dinosaur. Definitely time to get motivated, <laughs> okay? If you're going to do something, you better do it now. It is time to get moving, fella. Number one, we need to realize God is in control. Don't get nervous, okay? Psalms chapter 2, great tranquilizer. Uh, we've covered that before, you know. God is laughing at their plans for a new world order. God's going to finish the work that he began. Satan might think he's going to take over and usurp authority and take and build a kingdom. Well, he's a loser. Uh, God is going to win. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Matthew chapter 21 talks about that, the stone that the builders rejected. And some have argued that the Great Pyramid, actually, the original Great Pyramid, was a symbol of, you know, God's kingdom, and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And that's why Satan chose that for the back of the dollar bill. He thinks he's going to be the chief cornerstone. Lucifer, the enlightened one, you know. Anyway, the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. Talks about in the book of Daniel. Isaiah says, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted above the hills. God is going to win. We don't need to be nervous. Second point to make. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The Bible talks about that in Matthew chapter 10. We need to be careful for nothing. The word careful comes from two words full of care. Don't be full of care. And I think we don't do this very well, but we were commanded to be careful for nothing. And we're not, most folks anyway, are <laughs> not doing very well at that. We're nervous about everything, okay? We need to pray for those in authority. We were commanded in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for those in authority. We need to pray for our president, pray for our congressman, I met a couple weeks ago with several Arkansas state representatives, had dinner with them. You know, they're good, godly men. They want to do what's right. There are some really good people in government. They want to do right. Joe Scarborough, our representative here, came to my house, sat on the couch. We talked for a while. I said, Joe, what's your philosophy of education? He said, we ought to shut down the Department of Education. I said, you got my vote. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. There are some really good people. We need to pray for them. They are in the middle of a war. It's a battle, folks. Okay. Since we're God's children, assuming you're saved, our job is simply to obey the boss. We're his children, he's dad, do what he says. Plain and simple. He told us, go preach the gospel. He told us to be the salt of the earth. Now, salt does a lot of interesting things. Salt flavors. So one of our jobs as Christians, we should be adding a good flavor to our neighborhood, to our area. People that meet you should come away uh, improved. Like, wow, I learned something, or I, you know, I, I was inspired, or something. Okay, you should be, you should be flavoring people that you're near. Salt also irritates. If nobody's irritated at you, you're you're probably not a very good Christian. <laughs> now, you don't have to try to irritate anybody. You try to be salty, that will irritate them. Salt preserves from corruption. They pack meat in salt. Bacteria can't grow. If there was enough Christians salting down the country, we would prevent the corruption. Apparently, there aren't enough Christians. Okay? I think we should use our influence. Right now, we still have the freedom to influence school boards. We ought to run for school boards, get involved in politics. Some Christians say, oh, you shouldn't get involved in politics if you're a Christian. Oh, I'll tell that to uh, King Solomon, King David, Daniel, you know, <laughs> who's real high up in... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the wicked king's kingdom. If it weren't for some godly men involved in politics in Babylon, it would have been much worse. I mean, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, godly people involved in politics in Babylon. Yes, we need Christians involved in politics, okay? We need to teach the truth about creation. In the book of Acts, there are two great sermons. Acts chapter 2, Peter was preaching... Uh, and he talked to the Jews, and so he quoted scripture after scripture, and you know, because the Jews are familiar with scripture. Acts chapter 17, Paul's preaching on Mars Hill to the heathen who have no concept of scripture. So there, he used creation as a means of evangelism. You read Acts 17 carefully, Paul said, I held this altar to the unknown God. Um, he said, I want to talk to you guys about this, this unknown God. He starts off his sermon, God that made the world... Well, this must be the head God, if he's the one who made the world, you know. And so he used creation as a means of, of evangelism. Never did quote one verse. It wouldn't have mattered to these folks.
the heathen on Mars Hill didn't care what the Bible said. He just used creation. And I think if America ever was a Christian nation, I don't know, but it isn't now. And we have to get back to using creation as a means of evangelism. It's a very powerful tool. Students all across America are being taught evolution philosophy. They're going to be taught it tomorrow. We're paying to teach them this stuff. We're destroying their faith. They're going to be tested on things. Here's a chapter summary from Holt Biology. Uh, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. I mean, they just state it like it's a fact. Kids got to learn this, memorize it, get tested on it. We're, we, we are paying for the destruction of their faith. So I think we need to teach creation. Who owns this world anyway? If a student goes to the public school, he's going to end up thinking, well, hey, there is no God, so uh, I must be in charge. I'm God. Saw the cutest video clip one time. I, I got to get a hold of it. This, uh, some lady, I forget her name now, who claimed to be, uh, you know, God is within you. Oh, what's her name? Uh, she's standing on the beach. Standing out there saying, I'm God. You know, hollering out at the waves as the waves come crashing in. And so these guys had taken this, she re this lady really, what was her name? Oh. Anyway, she's standing there over and over. She'd say, I'm God, you know, building self-image, you know. And so they had taken video footage of this, and they slowly zoomed out. You know, it's going, I'm God. And pretty soon it's, I'm God. And you see from way up there in the sky, there's a little bitty person on the beach, you know, I'm God. And then it shows God up in heaven, looking over the edge, saying, hey, Gabriel, come here, look at this. <laughs> That was so cute. Well, if I'd have to do another one, David, you can do that in the editing department after you get all the other projects caught up. Okay. If a kid goes to school 12 to 16 years in the public school, he's probably going to lose his faith in God's Word. 75% of the kids do. Number six, don't get distracted. There's a war going on. Okay? Stay focused. You guys in the Marines, they, they teach you. Don't get distracted. Your job is to do this, and they do everything they can to distract you. Spray cold water on you, fire bullets over your head, you know. <laughs> every, and you have to learn to concentrate on what you're doing in spite of all the distractions. When I taught school, that was good training for me, because just about everything that can happen will happen. Since I've been preaching 12 years, I've seen just about everything. I'm up there preaching in the pulpit. We had a lady die in the back row one time. Ambulance comes, <laughs> paramedics come in, carry her out. We've had them puke. We, you just... Just nearly everything's happened while I'm preaching. Eric, you'll see the same thing. You just, just keep on preaching, okay? Don't get distracted. It's so easy for us to get distracted with houses and cars and, you know, riches and cares of this world. So easy. And so many children of God are doing nothing for Him because of they're distracted. They want to get more things. You know, you put these things over the crib of a baby. You wind it up. And it goes around and around, and the kid goes, ah. <laughs> The purpose is to distract them. It's called a mobile. And it works great. Satan is really good at distracting us. We have to concentrate. That stay focused on what God has told us to do. Average American watches 1,500 hours of TV a year. That's enough time to read your Bible 22 times. Now, I don't think you ought to sit around and read your Bible 24 hours a day, okay? But you ought to read it once in a while, okay? Psalm 101. Psalm said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I think we have set wicked things before our eyes. I've often said, what if you made a rule around your house that if you heard a curse word on TV, you had to shut it off for two hours? Up in college when I was in Michigan, one of the guys... Went to school, he was a little crazy anyway, but he'd been out target practicing with his pistol, 38 or whatever he had, you know, and he's sitting in their TV front of, watching, watching a John Wayne movie while he's cleaning his pistol, you know, keeping it around the house for security. And John Wayne comes galloping across the screen, you know, a typical cowboy, shoot him up, whatever it was, you know. And John Wayne cussed, said a bad word. So this guy, Boom! <laughs> blew his TV all over the living room. Shot it. I mean, picture tubes implode, you know, there are vacuum in there. He said, nobody cusses at me in my living room. <laughs> well, maybe just a little far, you know, radical, but uh, I like that philosophy. And I'm afraid we've tolerated things in our living room that we would not have tolerated 20 years ago. The Bible says, for the transgression of the land, 
Many are the princes thereof. You know why we have so many bureaucrats? You know why you got 80 people wanting to tell you how to build your house? Because we're wicked. We deserve it. The Bible says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Here's the solution. God said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, vote Republican, join the militia, store up survival foods. No, that's not what it says, is it? <laughs> humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Might as well stop right there. We're not doing it. But if we did, God said, I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Only solution to the problems America has and the world has, the only solution is Second Chronicles 7.14. David's dad sent him off to take some bread and cheese and you know raisins to his brothers when they're fighting the Philistines. David's brother, Eliab, uh, saw little David coming up, and David was saying, Hey, who's this big old guy, Goliath, out there? Why don't, why don't you guys go out there and beat him up? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, the guy is nine or, nine or ten feet tall. And Eliab, David's brother, said, Hey, why don't you go back home and take care of your sheep? What are you doing here anyway? You know, get out of here, punk. David said something classic, and I love it. Little David said, Is there not a cause? We've got to get some children of God to get this philosophy. Look, there's a cause. I'm going to do what's right, regardless of what it costs. There's a cause. Our founding fathers, 225 years ago in this country, said, look, there's a cause. We have no chance of beating the largest army in the world. I mean... These 13 American colonies that can't even get along with each other are going to take on England? Well, yeah. <laughs> they did. Just about lost it many times. <laughs> but they won. You just got to decide, what's your cause? I am convinced a lot of people are wasting a lot of time plucking leaves off the evil tree instead of getting to the root. There's a lot of things that we can fight. You can get involved in you know, fighting abortion. I think we should. You can get involved in fighting racism. That's a good cause. You can get involved in fighting paganism, euthanasia, the drug culture, the drug wars. Yeah, there's lots of good causes. But I think they all stem from a basic root of evolution, which is rejection of God. I'm going to devote my time and energy and money to cutting the whole tree down. I'm going to go right for the cause of all of them. Because all the rest of these are founded, all the rest of these uh, isms are founded on evolution. Henry David Thoreau said, There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. I would recommend you devote your life to striking at the root. Is this your cause? A ball? Any game, be it basketball, baseball, golf, tennis, doesn't matter, can be addictive. When I played tennis in high school, man, it just, I, I, I couldn't get enough. I loved it, you know? And I, I realized, man, I'm, I'm addicted to this game. It's, it's, it's taking away all my time. The Bible says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. If you're not careful, even as a child of God, Satan has had 6,000 years of experience, okay? You're no match for him. He knows how to get you distracted on something in this world. The people that have a fast motorcycle, you know what they want? A uh, faster one. <laughs> and, you know, they've got one that already goes 500 miles an hour, and then they'll go out and spend $2,000 and get, you know, expansion chambers and headers, <laughs> racing slicks, and, you know, there, there is no end. I was, our bus route up in Michigan, I was out visiting one Saturday, and there's a guy working on his dragster. Had it parked in his front yard, you know. Well, I've done mechanic work all my life, and I, you know, love working on cars, so I talked to him for a while. I said, man, how fast will it go? And he's telling me how fast it'll go. It was a, uh, I forget what kind of car it was now. It had two four-barrel carburetors. I said, what kind of gas mileage you get? He said, well, it takes me a gallon and a half to run a quarter of a mile. 
<laughs> See, that's about uh, six gallons per mile. <laughs> Not too good. Not miles per gallon, gallons per mile. But he, th he had, you know, roller rocker arms and, you know, and he was telling me, yeah, as soon as I get the money, I'm going to do this and this and this to it. <laughs> I said, well, when, when do you stop? When, when do you know you've, you've got it? I said, oh, that'll never happen. <laughs> and it won't, will it? Never going to happen. People that have 50 pairs of shoes in their closet, guess what they want? More shoes. It takes us a lifetime to learn that. Things on this earth aren't going to satisfy. We just think. When Henry Ford made it, became a millionaire, which back in the early 1900s was a lot of money, somebody said, Henry, now you have a million dollars. What do you want? He said, another one. <laughs> How much money does Bill Gates have? Think he has enough yet? Think he, uh, does he think he will ever have enough? No. I don't know why we're so slow to learn this, but it's true. I see people get absolutely addicted to different games. I took a course on golf in college. I enjoyed it. It's fun, you know. But man, I thought, you could get so trapped spending money and time so easily. I tell people, if you're willing to practice thousands of hours, someday you'll be able to knock a ball into a hole in the dirt. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? So true. What we should do, seek those things which are above. See, if you seek first the kingdom of God, He'll take care of everything. He'll provide for you. He promised He would. Colossians 2 said, Set your affection on things above. 1 John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. It's all going to burn. Lester Roloff, somebody gave him a brand new Chrysler. Big, you know, kind of like the Lincoln, only in the Chrysler family, whatever car it was back then, years ago. Johnny Pope in Texas, his assistant pastor, uh, Downs, uh, Johnny Downs, was at the Roloff Homes. He was a kid in trouble, went to the Roloff Homes to straighten him out, you know, and he stayed there while he was there. Somebody had given uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Brother Roloff this brand new Chrysler, you know, sitting in the garage. And Brother Roloff says, hey, Johnny, go back my car out for, you, for me, would you? Well, Johnny, uh, so excited, you know, wow, I get to drive this brand new car. Jumped in the car, all excited. I get to help Brother Roloff. Wow, forgot to shut the door. Backed out, tore the front door right off the brand new car on the side of the garage door. Roloff hears this crash. He just calmly walks out. And Johnny's, Johnny, I'm sitting at lunch with Johnny. He's telling me this whole story. He said, I thought he was going to kill me. Brother Roloff, just n not the least expression on his face. He said, that's okay, Johnny. It's all going to burn. It's all going to burn. Well, some people, you scratch their new car, <laughs> they, cut, they absolutely lose their Christianity, right? Hey, it's all going to burn. If we could just get that attitude, the world passeth away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I think we need to listen for the trumpet. It's coming soon, folks. 1 Thessalonians tells us, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Southern Baptists get to go first. And then the rest of us are leaving, okay? Shortly thereafter. <laughs> I like picking on Southern Baptists. I preach at a lot of their churches. Um, Lord's coming soon. Then the Bible says, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord uh, in the air, so shall, ever, shall we ever be with the Lord. Lastly, Win souls. Find somebody you can get converted. Number seven was listen for the trumpet. Number eight, win souls. As I look at life from my limited perspective of 48 years, nothing else is going to matter. If I leave any legacy at all for my kids or for my people that I influence, uh, I want people to say, wow, he, he wanted to reach other people with the gospel. 
Nothing else is going to matter. I'm not trying to make a bunch of money. I'm not trying to build a kingdom. I'm not trying to build a reputation. I want to win. I want to influence others. As a 16-year-old, brand new Christian, after I led my first person to the Lord, I got down on my knees beside the little old metal chair, just like one of these. And I said, Lord, I don't have a clue what you want for my life. I'm only 16 years old. But I'd like to do this the rest of my life. Well, it's been 32 years now, and uh, that's still all I want to do. Some people just want to make money, want to drive fast cars. Hey, I'm happy with my moped. I really am. <laughs> I mean, I, I really am. Doesn't matter. It's all going to burn, folks. Either one of souls is wise. Find something to do. Tell the story about the first soul I led to the Lord. And, uh, need to read the last chapter, folks. Keep in mind, we win. There is coming a thousand-year reign of Christ. It's not going to be the Third Reich, the reign of the Aryan, you know, Hitler guys for a thousand years. Now, he lost. Jesus Christ is going to win. Rule and reign for a thousand years. Nothing else is going to matter. Satan is going to be bruised. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Be with you. Amen. God wins in the end. We're going to see Satan cast into the bottomless pit. That's going to be cool. Going to shut the door. He's going to deceive the nations no more. He has plans to rule the world. Right now, he is deceiving the nations. But we don't need to be nervous. Find something to do. To win souls. Nothing else is going to matter. Okay. Next week, we're going to talk about... Um, start in on what's on our videotape number six about the flood. The Hoban theory of what I think caused the flood. And we don't know how long that'll last. We'll cover, it'll be class 10 of this CSE 103, and then we'll go into CSE 104, and we're going to do as long as necessary to cover the flood. And I think that's a key issue that Christians have missed. The scoffers in the last days, the Bible says, are ignorant of the creation and the flood. We need to understand that thing if we're going to put the pieces together. Thank you. See you next week.